Good evening and welcome to the Dugan Daily, your dose of breaking news, health and technology. I'm Olato Mungale. And I'm Mukhato Masamola. In your top stories this evening, ARVs are being revolutionized and some citizens are giving Eskom the middle finger. But first, xenophobia rears its ugly head again. As attacks escalate in South Africa, violence is not the only problem in foreign national space. A change in passport laws has made it difficult for foreign national students to return to South Africa. Our reporter Stephanie Shumba has a story. On Friday, Rhodes University gathered its students and staff to march against the xenophobic attacks that have been taking place in South Africa. The protests gained a lot of support from both international and local students. However, although a number of international students are now in South Africa, many of them are still stuck in their countries of origin. SRC International Councillor Tessa Ware explains why. In previous years, what you could do is you could come into the country on a visitor's visa and then while you were here, you could register on that visa and then you could go to Port Elizabeth and you could change that visitor's visa into a study visa. So you could do it while you were in the country. That has now changed. So what that, that has meant is that students have had to go through the process of trying to get a study visa in their countries, which has meant that they have struggled to get back to Rhodes in order to register. Zimbabwean student Lizwe Dizwano was one such student who was caught unaware of these changes and became stuck at home. When I applied for my visa, um, they told me 15 working days, but I actually didn't get it in 15 working days. So I ended up retrieving my passport from the embassy and flying back so I, so I won't be late for registration. Then I had to go back, then I had to go back home in April to get my visa again, and then they say 15 more working days. And as a result, I was like two weeks late for school. Apart from the financial strain of traveling back and forth, these delays will most likely have a negative impact on the marks of those affected. Some students have been very proactive in regards to catching up work. That said, the, the time and the stress and everything else involved in getting the visas meant that it, it's not a matter of students are saying, oh, I don't care, I don't want to catch up. But like there are very real issues that have made it difficult for students to catch up. So I know some lecturers have been fantastic in terms of getting people their stuff and some not so much. I have friends. They send me like notes and stuff and yeah, that's how I got by. But it wasn't enough because most of the lecturers that we have, they didn't. Um, they don't put lecture notes on, on how you can message and stuff, so it was hard work. Yeah, maybe I might just pass. While Rhodes International Office has reportedly helped many students, there are many others who feel abandoned. I do know that the International Office did do a lot to assist students, particularly I know in terms of police clearances, they were making plans. In terms of speaking to the university, they were doing a lot of work. Um, so do I think a lot was done? Yes. Do I think more can be done? Definitely. It's just really depressing how the whole process went, and I think that the uh, university should just, I don't know, should be more helpful to the foreign students, you know, because it seems like Rhodes, Rhodes as well is not really, um, doesn't really help foreign students that much. Although many of the students have had problems getting back to school at the beginning of the year, many of them have managed to register and continue with their studies. It remains to be seen whether those still stuck at home will be able to escape the bureaucratic mess and make it back in time for their June exams. This is Stephanie Shumba reporting for the Dugan Daily. Thank you so much to Stephanie. In health news, a new cell phone app speeds up the process of finding out whether an HIV AIDS patient needs to take ARVs. Douglas Smith went into the biotechnology labs at Rhodes University to bring you more information. The common perception is that everyone with HIV should be on antiretroviral or ARV treatment, but this is not the case. ARVs are not effective once the virus has progressed beyond a certain point, which means that healthcare workers need to determine the strength of the virus before prescribing ARVs to patients. The Biotechnology Center at Rhodes University is fast-tracking this process through science and technology. They are working on a faster method for determining whether or not HIV patients can be helped by ARV treatment. The progress of HIV is measured by the amount of CD4 cells in the blood. So we want to see how many CD4 cells there are in here. So we'd want to see if there's less than 200 or more than 200 because if there's less than 200 it means the person has full-grown AIDS. 
and if there's less, if there's more than 200, you're still healthy and you can take antiretrovirals. Currently, CD4 cell count can only be determined after a few weeks. The new method would give results in 20 minutes. The virus progresses quickly without the presence of ARVs, so the time saved will be saving lives. Nationwide, it is estimated that over 6.1 million people are living with HIV, a large portion of whom should be on antiretroviral treatment. This new diagnostic technology will help healthcare workers at clinics and hospitals like Settlers Hospital to get medication to patients faster. And a part of this, this, whole, this whole model is that we are ultimately trying to develop products that will address real societal issues. So issues in the environment or issues in healthcare or water treatment or even electricity generation. The test uses a new color change reaction to show CD4 cell counts in the blood using a sensor strip. A smartphone app detects the results of the color change and then determines whether the patient needs ARVs. The biotech center has used 3D printing to create a device to aid the smartphone app. So the idea behind this is that we printed this kind of generic smartphone cover that can actually um, function as a hood to allow for better imaging and better photography of the sensor strip. We can actually then get an accurate representation of the strength of the color. A lighter color indicates the patient has less CD4 cells, which means the body won't respond to ARVs, while a darker color indicates more CD4 cells, meaning that ARVs will still be an effective treatment. So it's portable, it's cheap, it's um, effective and can be used at, at local clinics and facilities wherever the, CD, the HIV tests are being done. This is Doug Smith for Dugan Daily. The Daily Dugan will be back after the short commercial break, and then Lolu Ngukana is back with the weather forecast. Fashion is a way to speak to people without having to say anything. Style is very personal. Um, and style caters to whatever you feel at that particular time. So if I choose to look a specific way every single day, that is up to me. I just like to mix uh, clothes together, like formal and casual. It's uh, positive, negative, it's what else. As long as people are talking about it, I'm doing something right with it. Bargain shopping. <laughs> this is a crop top from JJ's. Mm -hmm. This is a skirt I got two years ago from uh, Mr. Price. Mm -hmm. And I got these shoes from Legit. And I got the body from Zim. <laughs> Makeup is, is very important. I feel like it completes the entire outfit. It's always a reaction. Most people, it's just a side eye. Or some people would actually ask if you are wearing pants. You're watching the Dugan Daily. In light of the recent electricity crisis, South African citizens are taking matters into their own hands. Generators and solar panels are hot on the market for emergencies during load shedding. There are, however, some citizens living entirely off the grid. Sarah Middleton has the story. While most of Grahamstown sits in total darkness during load shedding, some residents are not affected by it. This is not because ESCOM has spared them, but because they have decided to move off the grid. Ed Delaray, who lives just outside Grahamstown, is one of these people. When we started off, I literally didn't have any solar panels. Um, I couldn't afford it at the time. And we had a single battery, which we used to hook up um, for lights, one or two lights. And then I would go and charge my battery um, at a friend's place or in town when it ran out of charge. Um, and we grew from there. I have pretty much all the normal appliances that other people have. I have a fridge. I have multiple computers, multiple gaming machines, monitors. If we're going to use high-powered devices, then I will quite often run the generator at the same time. So how much will it cost the average home to go off the grid? First, you will need solar panels to collect power to make electricity. 
These cost around 3,500 each. The average home will need 12 to run completely off the grid. Next, you will need batteries to store the electricity collected by the solar panels. You will need at least four, priced at 3,500 each. Then you will need an inverter to convert the battery current to the mains electricity. This will cost around 15,000. There are other costs that you must consider, such as cables, switches, and the cost of installation. These miscellaneous costs could set you back roughly 15,000. So in total, to take your family completely off the grid, you are looking at roughly 90,000. This cost makes it totally inaccessible for lower income groups. However, this option is appealing to more and more people that have the means to get away from the inefficient ESCOM. Ron Vessenberg runs his family home without any municipal intervention. The supply, as we've seen in the last couple of years with uh, state um, electricity supply, is not reliable uh, and is becoming extremely expensive. Making a decision to be free of government services, you need to analyse the particular government that you're dealing with. In South Africa, it's an absolute necessity. I think ESCOM is the only business in the world which actively encourages its customers to use less of its product. So being free of ESCOM is a no-brainer. It's like having the need to have a medical aid in South Africa. With the ever-looming threat of ESCOM turning off Makano's electricity, more and more residents are switching to alternative energy sources. So what this means, we'll be seeing less of electricity from places like this and more from solar geysers and solar panels. This is Sarah Middleton signing off for Dugan Daily. Apart from foggy and colder weather conditions along the western and southern coastline, it's going to be a fine and warm day countrywide. Cape Townians can expect a hot day in the mother city with a high of 24 degrees. George, 25 degrees. Port Elizabeth with a maximum of 26 and 29 in Grahamstown. East London at 25 degrees as well as mid-20s in Durban and Nelspruit. Pretoria with a high of 23 and Johannesburg with a maximum of 22. Uppington can expect isolated showers and thunderstorms overnight. Kimberley has a 60% chance of thunderstorms. And last, but certainly not least, Bloemfontein will be warm with 24 degrees with partly cloudy skies. That's all from me. Have a fantastic evening. Thank you for joining us on the Do Good Daily. Stay tuned for the entertainment news with Patrick Donnelly. I'm Olaga Domangale. And I'm Okaitwa Masimola. Good, Good night. night.